Hello students and welcome to my video meant to help you prepare for your assessment on instructional segment four in our Living Earth NGSS curriculum on the inheritance of traits. This particular assessment will focus on DNA. I encourage you to stop the video multiple times and to uh, ask yourself questions and to construct explanations. Uh, please don't just passively watch it. That's not going to uh, help you learn the most. And also check out the resources available on Classroom, including the Amoeba Sisters videos, the study guide, the practice problems, and go back through all the activities we did in class. And I hope you really enjoyed this unit, learning about how DNA contains the information needed to code for proteins. And then I think you will really enjoy our next unit on genetics, where a gene is a segment of DNA coding for a protein that we can uh, use probability and statistics to figure out what will be inherited. Like all my videos, this is not for profit. This is meant solely to help students here at TASM or anywhere on the interwebs. And all the images I try to make sure are um, able to be shared. And a lot of the stuff comes from Khan Academy, which you can get for free at KhanAcademy.org. Let's dive in. All right, here are our NGSS standards. Um, they're pretty cool. They're so much different than the standards I had in the past when I was teaching in the States. Um, ask questions to clarify relationships about the role of DNA and chromosomes, encoding for uh, the instructions for characteristic traits passed from parents to offspring. So I want you to come up with good questions that we can test on that. And then construct an explanation based on evidence for how the structure of DNA determines the structure of proteins, which carry out the essential functions of life through systems of specialized cells, so protein synthesis. Let's jump right in. We started out with the phenomenon of muscular dystrophy. You watched a video on it, you made observations, and we made driving question boards in class. Many of your questions revolved around, does this affect certain ethnicities? Why did we only see boys affected by this in the video? Um, how is it passed on between generations? Um, what are some of the ways that we can treat this? What are some of the outcomes of this disease? Muscular dystrophy stands for muscle weakness. The word dystrophy here, you can see it be broken down into bad nourishment. And I hope by the end of our genetics part of this unit, you have a, all of your phenomena questions answered. We did some other interesting phenomena in here as well um, with the bubble boy and um, some other uh, diseases such as cystic fibrosis. So here is the dystrophin gene that's going to be dealt with in muscular dystrophy. This is on the X chromosome. A gene is a segment of DNA. And so here it's, it's rather large. It's going to be 2 million base pairs long. And so on the X, so therefore uh, men only have one X chromosome. And so therefore they're more likely to be affected by this disease. It's on the P arm, which is the top arm of the chromosome. And we have the area located, et cetera. And so hopefully we can come up with some uh, treatments for it. There are different types of muscular dystrophy. There's Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where there's a complete loss of the dystrophin protein. And you often see these uh, poor boys in wheelchairs and unable to really move that much. And then you have misshapen dystrophin. This is going to be Becker muscular dystrophy should be a less severe form of the disease. And here's just a picture of the dystrophin protein. So we're dealing with some type of mutation to this protein here. So let's get into it. And then um, we will get here for some of the treatments that uh, are being piloted for this. And hopefully, as I mentioned in class with Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpente, um, that CRISPR could provide some really groundbreaking work in this area. The other phenomenon we looked at was the bubble boy. And so David Vetter and um, his legacy of what he left us and what it means uh, for him. We looked at uh, that was SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency, and his version was X-linked. Um, we also looked at an autosomal, that means not on a sex chromosome version, in the Explore Learning Gizmo that we completed in class as well. Um, X-linked, we'll get into this with genetics, so we haven't done this yet, but are more likely to affect men because men only have one X chromosome. If it's recessive though, and if, if the dad has it, the uh, daughter could have it as well. All right, so if you looked at your study guide and I printed it out here to make sure I cover everything, I asked you to review um, the experiments leading up to the discovery of the structure and function of DNA. And so this is after World War II, a lot of people turned their, uh, 
their directions towards trying to figure out uh, DNA. So let's go back in time a bit here. Here's a timeline of it. Um, and so it uh, really started out with um, figuring out uh, with Frederick Griffith's transformation experiment. Before him was Thomas Hunt Morgan and Alfred Sturdivant that did some work with uh, fruit flies and they figured out that there was chromosomes. And so then um, there's a whole series of experiments that we'll work through here. I'm not interested in you memorizing the experiments. I mean, you can if you want to. What I think would be more helpful is if you are given a figure or a graphic and for you to construct claim evidence reasoning dealing with these experiments. And so uh, Hunt and Sturdivant proved that genes are on chromosomes, but the question was, are these genes proteins or DNA? You know it's DNA, but at the time they did not know that. So here's the first one. I might give you something like this in your assessment. So here would be the picture. And can you construct a meaningful claim evidence reasoning using this graphic to help you out? So take a look at it for a minute. Okay, let's roll. What I see here is that this blue or this rough strain of pneumonia that's injected into this mouse, the mouse's immune system can handle it and it lives. This one has something different added to it. It's got the smooth outer capsule and this is going to make the uh, pneumonia really bad and it's going to kill the mouse. Here we heat up the pneumonia. So we um, boil it per se, and we put it in a mouse and the mouse lives. And this makes sense, right? If you're out in the wild and you need to drink water, you might boil it to make sure that there's not uh, microorganisms in it that are gonna make you sick. Here's the interesting one, right? You put the blue or the rough strain with this heat killed smooth strain and it trans forms the rough strain into something that can kill the mouse. So there was some properties that transform like a transformer from this heat killed smooth strain to the rough strain. And he didn't know what it was, but you might be able to conclude that it's DNA. So let's look at what I would write for claim evidence reasoning here and you can pause the video. But my claim for the Griffith experiment bacteria can be transformed. The evidence as you saw on that graphic was the heat killed S transferred its powers or, or its properties to the R strain, making it deadly. Um, and that is transformation. This one, Avery McLeod and uh, McCarty deal, dealt with, well, what is that transforming factor? And they looked at proteins, RNA, and DNA. So this is a really important experiment. So go ahead and pause the video and look at this graphic and see if you can do claim evidence reasoning. All right, for this one, you can look at it and say that DNA was a transforming factor. This uh, experiment is challenging for students, um, I found in a pass. So they use this enzyme to disable the DNA. And when they disable the DNA, then when you put the heat killed S strain plus the R strain together, the R strain is not transformed. It does not kill the mouse. So even though it, it it's like a double negative, even though it doesn't transform, then that's showing you that DNA was the transforming factor because when it's removed from the equation, then it's not transformed. And so here the converse, they use an enzyme to disable proteins and the heated S strain still transforms the R strain, still makes it poisonous. So therefore it is not proteins that are the transforming factor, it is DNA. And we can go back and look at that picture to make this a little clearer. Right here is the enzyme to chop out the proteins. You put that together with the R cell, does R cells still become deadly? I just um, wrote this down here for uh, ease of, of teaching is what I covered up here. I got this from um, Bio Ninja. Here they added an enzyme RN that chops up RNA, and then they added the R cells to the heat killed S cells, and the R cells still became deadly. So they were still transformed. So cutting out the proteins, they're still able to transform. Cut out the RNA, they're still able to transform. But you cut out the DNA, and they cannot transform. The R cells do not become deadly. The mouse still lives. Many of you are quite concerned for the mice, and that is good. It means you are good people. All right. Up next is the Blender experiment, Hershey and Chase. Um, they uh, just really brilliantly just use radioactivity to kind of decide or to confirm that DNA is a transforming factor from Avery McCarty and McLeod's experiment. So I would give you a picture like this. I'd probably cut off the bottom, right? 
And so here you had these viruses, and these are viruses that infect E. coli. And they're, we're going to label them radioactively for sulfur and for phosphorus. So looking at these pictures now, pause the video, and can you make your own claim evidence reasoning on this? Okay, here it is. So the claim DNA is a genetic material transferred from viruses into bacteria. So they're going to grow these viruses in radioactive sulfur and phosphorus. Here's the unique thing. Sulfur is found only in proteins. Well, it's not only in proteins, but it's not in DNA. It's in proteins, not in DNA. Phosphorus is in DNA, but not in proteins. So that was just, what a beautiful way to construct this experiment. So if we wait and see which one ends up inside the bacteria, we know which one was being injected to transform it. And so just like you saw in class, you got to see the centrifuge. Um, it's going to put the more dense uh, items on the bottom and what's called a supernatant pellet here in the bottom of the test tube, just like your DNA was put in the bottom of the tube when you centrifuged it. And so they found that the radioactivity is in the pellet when it's the radioactive phosphorus. So in other words, it was DNA that was infecting the bacterium. And so that is our CER there. Okay. Um, this, I told you a story in class, um, and many of you all kind of got into it, um, and uh, hopefully you liked it. Um, and so here's Watson and Crick, and Watson's still alive. Everybody else has, has passed on. Um, here is uh, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin and Linus Pauling. So a lot of these people involved in trying to figure out the structure and function of DNA. And uh, Watson and Crick, Watson got to see Rosalind Franklin's um, uh, image of DNA, and from that he garnered some ideas of what the uh, structure and function of DNA could be, and he was able to publish that first. He also got to see some of her progress reports that she submitted to um, medical record societies without her consent or knowledge. And so, um, like I told you in class, not everything's in the textbook, right? And so nowhere in the textbook does it tell you that uh, James Watson is a racist and that he has lost lots of titles and he had to sell his Nobel Prize from that. Um, he is also a sexist and has said uh, many things that are not true uh, scientifically or that are bad just in general. Um, but that being said, he did uh, figure out DNA um, the question is, like, should we celebrate him or not? And like I said, um, I really enjoyed this quote by Adam Rutherford um, from a column in The Guardian. And, he, you know, he said, um, it's more that no one wants to, is interested in his racist, sexist views. Watson alongside Crick will always be to discover the double helix, to my mind, the scientific breakthrough of the 20th century. Here's our challenge. Celebrate science when it's great and scientists when they deserve it. And when they turn out to be awful bigots, let's be honest about that too, right? So they uh, did some good science and they also did some um, questionable ethics, right? And I want you to be great at science and at ethics. All right, so what, what in the world is DNA, right? We see it everywhere. Everybody talks about DNA. You say, it's in my DNA. This, it's in my DNA to be a footballer. It's in my DNA to, to love a certain sports team, Chelsea or uh, the Saints or something else, or here, progress is in his DNA for this Audi, right? Here is some type of uh, perfume that's going to make you anti-aging and has pictures of DNA on it. We see it everywhere. But what is it? Can you describe it? How would you describe it to a four-year-old? Can you describe it to a 15-year-old? How would you describe it to your biology teacher on your assessment? Hmm. Pause the video. Talk it out. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is inside the nucleus of the cell, and it's going to code for our uh, proteins that are made. And when you're looking at me, you're looking at all proteins here, right? It's the blueprint of life. It is the ability to pass on genetic information to the next uh, generation as well. Um, it's inherently beautiful, right? The passing on of information, and, and also it's imperfect passing on enables for um, evolution to occur and mutations to happen and new alleles to be made. And it's just um, a fascinating, fascinating uh, molecule to study. 
you can think of the bases of DNAs like letters. And so I taught you in class that there are four bases. There's adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We also did a pretty cool TED talk about looking at like, you know, encyclopedia style thick books full of letters. And that would be your DNA. There's like 18 huge AP bio textbooks worth of uh, letters in each and every single one of your cells. And the only difference between you and your friend is going to be one half of one book, right? Many, many, many parts of the genome are the exact same for people. We all have the same enzymes for glycolysis and other uh, functions. It's just that one half of a book that gives us our differences in skin color and hair texture and other uh, phenotypic appearances that we see. So... Genes are a segment of DNA that code for a protein, and that you can think of as a trait. Many of our traits are polygenic, or many proteins coming together. Um, and so here's an example. like the, You could pretend that this is a gene. This is a stretch of DNA, a segment of DNA. And so here's just giving you an example. Segment of DNA that codes for purple hair versus yellow hair. And these can be passed down between generations, right? So... I might ask you, how does the structure of DNA lead to its function? So pause the video here. This is quite a question. And hopefully you need to start with thinking about what is the function of DNA. And the function, like I've mentioned just a couple times here, is to serve as the hereditary material for all of life on Earth. Right? And so if, we, if all life uses DNA to pass on to the next generation, it's uh, inherently important that the blueprint for life is here. Also, the inherent mutability of DNA makes it the what it's acted upon in uh, evolution. And so here is the structure of DNA. Let's go ahead and talk about it. We have a sugar and a phosphate group. So sugar, phosphate, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And notice how they're anti-parallel in direction. They're going to be bonded to a base. So there's going to be adenine or A's and T's and G's and C's. The way that they're oriented make A's and T's bond together and G's and C's. This bond between the bases are going to be hydrogen bonds. They will be weaker than the bonds in the backbone that are covalent bonds. This is important because it enables us to open up DNA and read these bases or read the genes and also to copy it. You'll see that there's a difference between A's and T's and G's and C's. There's two hydrogen bonds here three here. Um, so many genes start with uh, an area called a Tata box or many A's and T's because that is an easier or be less bonds for the RNA polymerase to break open. Um, let's see some other stuff that you might be interested in. These are called purines, A's and G's and C's and T's are pyrimidines. It's not on your test or anything, but it's just the bigger one has to go with the smaller one. Bigger, smaller, smaller, or bigger. That way, the shape of DNA can be held as a double helix. So the inherent strength of the backbone, the weakness of the hydrogen bonds, those all contribute to the function of the molecule, which is to store hereditary information and code for proteins. Um, let's see. A nucleotide, the monomer of DNA, this single block, like one Lego piece, when you're making a big Lego puzzle, would be the phosphate, the sugar, and the base. There, as we went over, the strands are held together by weaker hydrogen bonds, so that way it can be opened and read. And the backbone is held together by stronger covalent bonds. And you'll learn about that in chemistry uh, with Mr. Kelly when, um, when atoms share electrons. So that would be a stronger bond. So you're not going to break the backbones like you will these hydrogen bonds. The strands run in opposite directions. So I told you, like, think about Salt and Caboose Highway, one going uh, one direction and the other highway going the other. And this helps to make sure that DNA has the right uh, major and minor grooves and the right shape, which is really important because DNA gets read by enzymes. So it has to have the right shape to be read by those enzymes. Don't worry about these numbers, five primes and three primes. If you're interested in that, that's more of an AP biology thing, but it's just helping to uh, determine the directionality of DNA. All right, here is one side of DNA. You code for the other side. Go for it. 
Hopefully you got something like this. The base pairing rules, A's and T's, G's and C's. My ninth grade biology teacher uh, taught me ashtray garbage can. Like you put those ashtrays in the garbage can. Don't ever smoke. It's terrible for you. Um, and maybe you can come up with a different one to help you out. Here's Erwin Shargoff, and he helped to figure out the, the A's and T's and G's and C's base pairing rule um, by just figuring out that the amount of A and the amount of T are uh, usually equal in an organism, the amount of G and the amount of C are equal in an organism, and together all four add up to 100%. So go ahead and try this question right here. Go ahead and pause the video. Okay, if A is equal to 30%, then... Um, T is equal to 30%. So you put those two together at 60%. Take 100 minus 60, you get 40% for C and G. And so it would be 20% for guanine. All right, that's structure and function. So you've made it through uh, items one and two, which were big on the study guide. So we're on to three, replication. Let's go there. Replication means to copy. So copying DNA. Um, you got to model this in class with uh, string and with Play-Doh, and then um, you know we we played with it on the Gizmo as well, um, and you seem to do really well on it. We also did a worksheet on it as well and a Google slide. So replication is a process where DNA makes a copy of itself. Why would DNA need to copy itself? What do you think? Well, when cells divide, they all need a whole copy of the uh, DNA blueprint so that we can they can do their job. Right? And they can transcribe the genes that they need to. So every single time a cell divides, it has a new copy of the DNA. Do you remember and can you model why is DNA replication called semi-conservative? Hopefully you got something along the lines of if we take this, split it open, and we have an old strand here and an old strand here denoted in blue, Due to the base pairing rules that A's always go with T's and G's always go with C's, complementary base pairing, as the new strand is made, these daughter molecules should be identical. And so A's and T's and G's and C's. So let's look at it here, just another model, another schematic to look at. The purple is the old strand. We open it up, one half old, one half new. Because of the base pairing rules, these strands, once they're done being made, should be identical. There's another picture of it, just so you can see it in action with the uh, X and a Y and then the, the new strand being attached to it. All right, what do helicase and DNA polymerase do? There's a lot more enzymes at play in DNA replication. So we can, we can increase the complexity if we want to, but this is good for our class. Um, helicase is going to help to unzip the DNA and help form the replication fork. So right here, it breaks those hydrogen bonds. And now when those hydrogen bonds are um, broken and the strands are exposed, DNA polymerase will come add the new nucleotides. And DNA polymerase will match up those A's and T's and G's and C's. It does this really fast. You can think about it as fast as a jet engine turning. Incredibly fast. Um, it's also going to uh, proofread it and double check it, et cetera. Here you see in this picture of them going in opposite directions. It's just because DNA has some directionality um, and there's some cool uh, ways that this works that you can come see me and talk about. Or uh, if you want to Google it, it's called Okazaki Fragments, um, but it's more of an AP thing. All right, the steps here. So DNA is unzipped by helicase um, and then DNA polymerase is going to attach to each strand, read them and uh, tack on the correct nucleotides. And eventually you would have two identical copies of DNA. Um, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. So this is a little bit, uh, we haven't gone over cells yet. This We're doing our class in this uh, interesting way where we get the cells next. Um, but it's fine. It still works. And so in eukaryotic cells, which are plant and animal cells, replication can begin in hundreds of places on the DNA molecule. That's the only way with which it could be copied fast enough. For us, whereas in prokaryotes or bacteria, it just starts uh, in one part of the one circular chromosome and then goes in each direction until it uh, meets up and makes an exact copy of it. Um, so there we go for eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Here's a bonus question. This is often called the most beautiful experiment in biology by Messelson and Stahl. Could you claim evidence reason this one? 
I am not going to put the answer in the video. Um, this is kind of for you and see if you can figure it out. It's pretty cool. All right. That is replication. So now we know how we can make a lot of copies of DNA. Well, now remember that we talked about DNA making proteins or coding for proteins. And so can you tell me the big picture of protein synthesis? On a side note, when I interviewed at Tasem in uh, 2015, December, and I, I came here in 2016, um, the principal at the time asked me to describe protein synthesis to him as if he were a ninth grade student that hadn't been exposed to it before. And so I talked about um, how you can think of DNA as like your grandma's a recipe, and then you're going to go and you're going to take a copy of it on a piece of paper to the grocery store. I guess nowadays you might write it out on your phone and you go there and you pick up all the ingredients, the different amino acids, and then you come back and you put those together to make the protein. And look, they gave me the job. Here I am. All right. So what's that big picture of protein synthesis? I kind of just spoiled it for you, but you go through it. DNA coding for RNA, coding for protein. We also call this the central dogma of biology. DNA is precious. It's going to be stored. Well, everything's precious, but uh, DNA is stored inside the nucleus. It's going to send an RNA transcript through a nuclear pore out into the cytoplasm of the cell. Here it will attach to a ribosome. And that ribosome will read the mRNA transcript and translate that into a protein. And that protein can go do work in the cell or leave the cell. Um, what are some examples of proteins, right? And so some examples might be insulin. Insulin is an excellent one. It's a protein-based hormone. So you eat a, a donut, your body's going to release insulin from the pancreas saying, hey, you got a lot of sugar inside of you. Hopefully you only ate one donut. Let's take this into our cells and start the process of uh, cellular respiration of glucose. All right, can you compare and compass, uh, contrast transcription and translation? Transcription is the act of going from DNA to RNA. It happens inside the nucleus and it involves the enzyme RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase will break the hydrogen bonds between this DNA molecule. It will read a gene and it will make an mRNA transcript. This mRNA transcript will leave the nucleus and go to a ribosome in the cytoplasm to be translated into a protein. So transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here is an image of RNA polymerase, right? So it's broken apart, this uh, DNA strand. Uh, this is a good picture because uh, it reminds me that, you know, when we think of chromosomes, chromosomes are DNA you know, route, what wrapped around some other proteins called histone proteins. So here comes that RNA transcript. Let's talk about RNA, right? Genes are uh, coded DNA instructions to control the production of proteins. DNA remains in the nucleus, but for it to get translated into proteins, it must be sent. Uh, it's message to ribosomes, and this message is called messenger RNA. So that was, that was a little bit of a repeat. Sorry there. Let's go ahead and talk about what is RNA. What are some of the important properties of RNA? Well, RNA is single-stranded. It contains the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose. Don't worry about memorizing that. But it does uh, have a different base. It has U instead of T. And so can you make the RNA for this DNA segment? Hopefully, I forgot to animate that. It should be U-A-U-C-G-C. All right, and there's a lot of practice problems on Classroom for you with this. A fun little trick you can remember is that RNA loves U. So C to G and A to U. If you see something with a bunch of T's in it, you know it's DNA, and if it's double-stranded, it's DNA, and if it's single-stranded, it's RNA, and if it's U's, it is RNA. What are those three types of RNA? This is a harder one because we didn't go over it a ton. You know that messenger RNA is going to be the transcript from the DNA in the nucleus, uh, which is sent to the ribosomes. RRNA stands for ribosomal RNA, and that combined with proteins help to make up a ribosome. So that is ribosomal RNA. 
Transfer RNA is very important. Transfer RNA carries the amino acids and it is specific for which amino acid it carries. There are 20 different amino acids, which we'll see you get them from some of them, your body synthesizes, some of them you get for the food you eat. So you can't just eat pizza all the time. All right. How does RNA we've made with RNA polymerase, this enzyme, it has made the RNA transcript, this mRNA. How does that code for the protein? Can you go through that process? Go ahead and give it a whirl. The process of translation. Okay. Hope you got something along the lines of this. So transcription made the mRNA transcript. The mRNA goes to a ribosome. It has a small subunit and large subunit. They um, dock on the mRNA. And eventually, we'll get to a start codon. This codon will be three letters long, three nucleotides long. It will match with its anticodon on the bottom of the tRNA molecule. So here is the codon, A-G-U. The anticodon here would be U-C-A. Here's a codon, CGU. The anticodon here would be GCA. Here's, an anti, uh, here's a codon, ACG. The anticodon would be UGC. Each of these anticodons is specific to which amino acid is brought to this growing chain. And this growing chain of amino acids is a protein. So the monomer or the building block of a protein is an amino acid. These bonds are very strong between the amino acids. They're called peptide bonds. They're also covalent. Each amino acid has its own characteristic, and those are called R groups that kind of hang off of the amino acid. And they will give it specific properties, like some of them really like water. Some of them don't like water. Some of them are charged. Some of them aren't. All of those R groups will interact to give the protein shape, to give it a shape. And so um, we will role play that. I forgot to, uh, we'll do a protein party in class to help you learn that. Let's go over this a little bit more. So here is uh, AUG. This is the start of each protein. This is um, called the start codon. So this would be the mRNA. All right? Remember, it came from the DNA. So if I wanted to go backwards, I could figure out the DNA. Could you figure it out? All right, the DNA would be T because that goes to A. A, which goes to U, C, which goes to G. So TAC is going to be the DNA here. AUG is the codon, three letters. The anticodon that matches with that is going to be UAC, and it's going to carry methionine. Here's a codon, GGA. That anticodon that's going to match with that is CCU, and it's going to carry glycine. Here's a codon, GUU. The anticodon is going to be CAA, and it's going to carry valine. You can do this by reading a codon wheel or a codon chart. Let's look at the codon wheel first. This is always representing mRNA. So if my mRNA is AUG, it's going to go AUG. You go first letter on the inside, second letter on the second level, third letter on the third level. AUG codes for methionine. Let's look at UCC. UCC codes for serine. Oh, well, let's look at UCA. UCA also codes for serine. There is some redundancy in the genetic code, especially for this third letter, and that's called the wobble effect. Sometimes the third letter can have, it could be, uh, you know, CAG, it could be U, UCAG here, and they all code for proline. So that makes the, uh, it helps to kind of lessen the impact of mutations. Here is how the chart works. First letter, you find the row. So if we're going to look up AUG, we're going to look first row here. Second letter is the column. So here's the U column. So it means it's somewhere in this box. And then you just kind of look for it. And you get AUG because from methionine or start. You'll notice that there are three stop codons and they are UAA, UAG, and UGA. What these do is they don't actually bring an amino acid. They don't bring one there. They stop the production of the protein so that the protein can be released from the ribosome and go off and do its work. Okay, that was transcription and translation. Let's go ahead to mutations and biotechnology, and we are done.
Can you describe how a mutation or a change in DNA can affect a protein? Mutations can be good or bad. All right, we can have a point mutation that changes one point and can substitute it. So we might substitute in somebody for football and substitute out somebody. We might change a G to an A. If this happens in a coding part of a gene, this could change a protein. This change will then be passed on to every daughter cell that's made from that cell. So we have proofreading mechanisms to try and uh, get these, but sometimes they still get through. Here's a nice uh, little sentence to kind of work on it. Cat eats big rat. We might have a point mutation. Cats eats big hat, right? Um, a frame shift mutation is what's called an insertion or a deletion, an indel for the no. So here, <clears throat> if you insert a letter or delete a letter, it can shift the whole reading frame and it can really change the uh, protein. And so in class, I did the fat cat ate the rat. And I inserted a letter, or I deleted it, and it changed the whole sentence. So here, cat eats big rat. If we add an A right at the beginning, it throws off the whole uh, reading frame right here. So we talked about point or substitution mutations, same thing. And then we talked about insertion or deletion. There can also be larger scale changes, such as copying big parts of the chromosome. Let's go over a little bit more about substitutions and what they may look like. And so a substitution can be silent, nonsense, or missense. Silent, nonsense, or missense. A silent mutation, let's go ahead and check this out. ATG, that goes for UAC. You go to your chart, that goes for tyrosine. Let's change the third letter here, like we talked about, the wobble effect. And instead of ATG, it becomes ATA. That goes for UAU, tyrosine, same amino acid. So the DNA was mutated, but it's silent. It doesn't change the amino acid in the protein. So everything's okay for that protein. Here, instead of being ATG, it becomes ATC. That was the mutation. That's now going to go for UAG, which is going to stop or cut off the protein early. The way I remember this, if you're uh, engaged in nonsense, your teachers may yell, stop or your parents may yell, stop your nonsense. So that is a nonsense mutation. It stops the protein. Here, the first or second letter is going to be changed. And so instead of being ATG, it becomes GTG, which goes for CAC, which codes for a, a different amino acid. And here it's going to code for histamine. Now, I'm not going to test you on this part, but it can be conservative or non-conservative. And what that means is that if it's conservative, it could be an amino acid that has similar characteristics to the one that was being replaced. And that might not change the protein as much. Or it can be non-conservative if it's dramatically different than the one that's being replaced, such as in sickle cell. All right. These are some slides that we actually didn't get to in class. I will try and go over them. Um, this comes from the gizmo with Lucy and where she had the ADA skid uh, diagnosis and you're trying to help her out. So there could have been a mutation in an enzyme. And an enzyme is a protein that helps to um, break down or build together molecules. Um, and your body can't live without them. They make these reactions happen very fast. And so this is an ADA enzyme that helps to break down a toxin. And so if there's a mutation in the active site, then this um, toxin would no longer be broken down because it would change the shape of the protein. So that's just an example of a real life mutation. Um, a nonsense mutation would just stop it from working. So here, the early stop codon, the, um, the toxin was not able to be broken down. And here, they gave you a new one, which was kind of interesting, that um, there could be a mutation that messes up tRNAs. And so they don't bring the correct amino acids. And that would be really uh, dangerous to protein production here. So you got to go through and you got to figure out which one it was and what uh, cause that skid diagnosis. Let's go back to muscular dystrophy, right? Muscular dystrophy is caused by a mutation and that mutation in DNA leads to a change in the protein, um, which leads to muscular dystrophy. All right. Biotechnology. Here we go. Last part of the video. If you made it this far, you're doing awesome. How do scientists make plasmids and what are plasmids used for? So in class, we listened to a rap song about this and you read about it and kind of modeled it a bit. 
Hopefully, uh, you remember that restriction enzymes can cut out a gene of interest. So if we want to make insulin, right, we can cut out someone's insulin gene. We can then insert it into a ring of DNA inside a bacterium. So a plasmid is a ring, a circular ring of DNA inside of a bacteria. If we insert the human insulin gene here, and if we make sure that there's, you know, the correct promoter and that there's a way for it to be copied, the bacteria will produce the human insulin protein, right? And that's pretty cool. We can then collect it uh, from it. And we just got to feed the bacteria, make sure it has a place to grow and it has the correct it has access to amino acids to um, make this protein. So that is a plasmid. If you're interested in doing it, we get to do it in AP Biology. You can come in and try that out. How do scientists compare DNA samples? So we did this both hands-on um, with a piece of tape, and I had you cut it up, um, and then also with an electrophoresis well, and then, which was fun, but I don't feel like we really understood what was going on. So then we did the virtual lab to kind of help bring it all together. So can you talk it out? Hopefully you got something along the lines of there would be a strand of DNA. So the FBI has identified areas where there's um, variability in our genome. We would get um, copies of DNA from those sections and then submit them to a restriction enzyme. And a restriction enzyme cuts upon a specific sequence in DNA. Restriction enzymes are proteins that uh, we got from bacteria as bacteria fight viruses that invade them and infect uh, the bacteria with, their, with the viral DNA. Once the DNA is cut up, we can put it into these wells and run it through a gel. The gel has small holes in it. And so the smaller fragments will make it through faster. Think about like a, a larger, a group of people trying to get through an obstacle course versus one really small, fast kid. And so they're going to, um, because DNA is inherently negatively charged, it will move towards the positive or the red anode in the electrophoresis well. So because you're going to have differences in your DNA uh, letters or base pairs, the restriction enzymes will cut different linked fragments. And so you can compare two different samples. Um, and if we run that against a known DNA ladder, we can kind of figure out um, who is who for, say, a paternity test or for um, a piece of evidence, et cetera. All right. How do scientists quickly copy lots of DNA? That's called polymerase chain reaction. And so you got to model this in class um, with paper and with jam boards, et cetera. Um, and we talked about it with the coronavirus PCR test. Basically, um, we're going to heat up DNA. When it heats up, that breaks those hydrogen bonds. We then attach primers that target a gene of interest. And then we get, we cool it back down a little bit and add TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase is DNA polymerase um, from a bacterium in the Yellows, uh, Yellowstone National Park hot springs. And so it will be able to synthesize new strands of DNA and then uh, we cool it, or then we heat it back up once it's done that, and it will break again. And then we cool it back down. We add the primers and we add TAC polymerase, and it'll make another strand doing the DNA base pairing rules, heat it up again. And so after the first round, you get two. After the second round, you get four. After the third round, you get eight. After the fourth round, you get 16, then 32. And so if you do this like 30 times, you get two to the 30th, you get like a billion copies of DNA and you get a whole lot. So we can amplify that, that segment. We can then use it for electrophoresis or we can test to see if you have that um, viral DNA or viral RNA on you, right? So if it's RNA, we got to go and reverse it. That's why you might see the, the letters RT in front of your PCR test for reverse transcriptase to go backwards to DNA. All right, students, that was our DNA work. Hope you enjoyed the video. Peace out. Good luck.